three, two, and a one. Let's go. All right. Okay, so what's next? Where are we going? So we are uh, going to head over to an exciting new world of differential equations. So, as of right now, I could totally solve this differential equation. This is a first-order linear differential equation. Find me an integrating factor. Have fun. Right, if I want to be extra spicy, I could hit this with the Laplace transform if I so wanted. But that's not enough, right? Even though this might model a nice uh, physical phenomenon, most physical phenomenons have a lot more than one dependent variable, right? There's more than one variable flying around out there in the world, and in fact, they're probably going to interact with each other. So a way of thinking about that in terms of differential equations is that I'm probably going to encounter systems of differential equations, that intermingle. So note here, I have two unknown functions, x and y. They have the same dependent variable, t. The derivative of x is negative y. So its derivative depends on the other dependent variable, plus t. Same thing for uh, y here. So this is now asking me, find two functions, x and y, so that the derivative of x is negative y plus t, and the derivative of y is x minus t. So there are the whole worlds of differential equations where there are multiple functions interacting with each other just like this. So we'll learn how to solve things like this, and now you might immediately notice that something you could do is take the derivative of the first, that'll give you the second derivative of x minus negative dy dt plus t uh, plus 1, derivative of t is 1, and I know what dy dt is in terms of x, and ooh, there we go. So this technique that I just did is sometimes called um, uh, decoupling, so in other words, uh, even though the functions were intermingling with each other, if I played around with it, in fact they weren't, I was able to decouple them. Right, and then now I've got a second order linear, I know how to solve those, Right, it's a second order non homogeneous, and then I could solve for x, and since I know x, I can then plug that information over in here and solve for y. Right, or I could plug it in here and solve for y that way. Either way would give you the final answer. All right, now that sounds great and all, right, because it definitely depends on everything we've just learned. So that seems like something we'd reasonably do. However, there's a much better way. And um, if the title for today wasn't clear, uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna be uh, talking about something else. Okay. All right. So, what is a matrix? Generally speaking, it's a rectangular array of mathematical objects. Nothing more, nothing less. That's all it is. Right, and we write them as so with a square bracket. Some people will use open uh, parentheses. I've seen that. That's not uncommon, but I like the square, so I'm going to do that. Um, we can represent a matrix by telling you what its entries are. Here I did A sub J sub K, where J tells you the first subscript and K tells you the second. Note, I used I and J to index. You do not use I to index. I is the imaginary unit. I squared is negative 1. Do not index using i. I will find you. Right? Don't tell me i is current, because that's wrong, too. <laughs> anyway, so here we go. We have an m by n matrix. m rows, n columns, right? It's a rectangular array, and this is how you can represent it. So note the first index are the rows, the second index is the columns. Uh, I always think of uh, rc cola. Um, or as I just started complaining about um, current, I guess RC current, uh, RC, uh, RC circuits, what am I talking about? Uh, RC, you know, RC current, kind of like recursive current, I don't know. <laughs> um, anyway, so yeah, there you go. Now, uh, note what I stressed here, mathematical objects. So, primarily speaking, you shove numbers into your matrix, so 1, 2, 3, 0, there's a 2 by 2 matrix, 2 rows, 2 columns. That is also a matrix. It's a two by one, two rows, one column. And note what its entries are. Its entries are functions. Mm -hmm. And yes, 
you can put matrices inside of matrices. Uh, they're called block matrices. Um, I've never seen somebody put a block matrix inside of a block matrix, but I'm sure somebody's done that. But yeah, so primarily we'll stick with uh, numbers and functions, but it's worth knowing that you can shove in any mathematical thing you want into a matrix, right? It's just a rectangular array of things. Um, although it's worth noting that basically numbers and functions and matrices are the things that you shove in there. Um, there are other weirdo things you can get in there, but let's not get into that. All right. Now, uh, why am I getting into these? Right. Well, we're going to connect these to the type of equations we just wanted to solve. Right. These systems of equations. But in order to properly get there, we've got to set up some algebraic facts about matrices. So let's do that. Oh, well, before I do that, i got some terminology to introduce before we uh, get going. So a square matrix is one where the same number of rows and columns, so we just saw a 2 by 2, a 3 by 3, a 4 by 4, so on and so forth. Um, a column matrix, we just saw one of those, a 2 by 1, has one column. Uh, we'll interchangeably use the word vector for column. Um, it turns out they, they are the same thing, in some sense. Uh, the zero matrix... <laughs> is the matrix that is just full of zeros. So specifically, here is the matrix with two rows and three columns that are full of zeros. If we really need to stress the size, we'll say zero sub two three to indicate what's going on. Um, and it's worth noting that if we've got uh, numbers with uh, multiple digits, we'll usually put a comma here to clarify. We're not gonna run into anything like that. So we're not gonna get too hung up on notation. Um, another matrix that we're going to run into is the identity matrix. This is a square matrix of ones on the diagonal and zeros elsewhere. And similar to the zero matrix, we'll indicate its size if we need to. So, for example, I3 is that matrix right there. It's a 3 by 3 ones on the diagonal. So, note when I say the diagonal, I mean we start in the top left and work our way down. And, uh, yeah, well, that's that. Okay. So like I said, let's get into, I uh, psyched myself out, I thought this was the next slide, now I had the fancy other things to talk about first. Yeah, let's get into uh, some matrix algebra, right? This will wrap back around to how are we going to solve systems of differential equations, trust me, we'll get there. But for right now, let's talk about how you uh, would add up two matrices. Well, you just add them entry-wise, right? That's formally what this is saying to do. So for example, take that 2 by 3 plus that 2 by 3 right there. Boom. 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. 1 plus 3 is 4. You see, you got it. <laughs> Nothing crazy. If I add, if I want to add two matrices, you just add up their entries. And uh, this has some nice properties. So, because we already know adding up numbers behaves well, that means that matrix addition will behave well. So, specifically, it has the associativity property and the commutativity property of addition. So, the associativity meaning, it doesn't matter where I put parentheses, it'll always have the same meaning, um, which is always a thing that, when it comes to mathematical operations, everybody forgets about, um, and is the main reason I feel like you get into those dumb internet fights about, like, what is 4 divided by 5, parentheses, some other junk. And it's like, division's not associative, so it's a meaningless statement. Right, so, like, whenever those dumb things happen, I show up and ruin the party, and then nobody listens to me, as usual. Um, but yeah, and it's commutative, right? A plus B is B plus A. It's a, the usual sort of thing there. All right, so we can scale a matrix in the same way that we can scale a function, and scaling goes the way you think it should go. Just scale it entry by entry. Okay. So, for example, if I take that matrix there and multiply it by negative one half, it turns into that. That's it. You just right scale two by negative one half, get negative one. Scale negative four by negative one half, get positive two. 3, negative 4, negative 5, positive 6, you know, just go down the list. Pretty much, right? Not This This is not supposed to be earth shattering or exciting. This is literally just bookkeeping right now. We're going to get saucy in a minute, but for right now, we're just nice and easy. So a couple things to notice. Obviously, if we take a matrix and add itself scaled by negative 1, well, then all the entries are going to knock out and I'll get the zero matrix. So, um... 
as is tradition in mathematics, we abbreviate something plus its negative as a, as a negative, um, as a subtraction. So something plus a negative of something. So subtraction is in real operation. It's addition with a negative prone in there. And scaling satisfies a couple of other things that we're going to want to point out because we're going to do a couple of matrix manipulations here and there. So we want to just be aware of what we're allowed to do. If I were to add up two scalars and then scale a matrix, I could have done those individually first. Likewise, if I scale a summation, I could scale and then sum if I wanted to. So scaling and addition have nice distributive properties. So it is worth noting that this one is quite interesting because this is the addition of real numbers, whereas this is the addition of matrices. So note here is the addition of matrices and addition of matrices. So this is actually like a conversion property. It's kind of interesting to keep that in your mind. All right, well, we've got adding, we got scaling, so obviously I'm going to multiply, and oh boy, that does not look like what you probably thought it was going to be. Right, naturally, you might have thought, oh, I'd multiply two matrices together by just multiplying their entries. Now, if it turns out that that is something you can do, that's called the Hadamard product, after a mathematician whose last name is Hadamard, um, and it turns out that nothing interesting happens there, it's really boring, and nobody cares. <laughs> um, the real thing everyone cares about is this multiplication. So, taking a matrix of size MN, and a matrix of size NP, so note the columns of A match the rows of B, the rows of A and the columns of B become the rows and the columns of A times B, respectively, and then in here you've got this nonsense going on. So formally that's how it is, but let's give it a go with um, an actual example. So let's take 1, 2, 3, 4, and multiply it by 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay. That's what it ends up being, but let's work for it in detail. So the first entry, the 1, 1 entry, the way this works is to take the first row, first column, multiply up the appropriate things and add them together. So first row, first column, 1 times 4 plus 2 times 2. Okay, row 1, column 2, first row, second column. So first row, second column, 1 times 3, 2 times 1, add them up. So if you've taken some vector stuff before, you'll notice that what I'm doing is taking a dot product of the rows and the columns, right? Likewise, the 2-1 entry, second row of A, first column of B. Second row, first column, 3 times 4 plus 4 times 2. 2-2 two, two entry, second row, second column, 3 times 3, 4 times 1, add them all up. And if you clean it up, you get 8, 5, 20, 13. Because, sure, why not? Okay, so that's how we multiply matrices together. And like I said, very specific reasoning for this. It'll become clear in a moment. But I do want to now point out that matrix multiplication has some nice properties and some not nice properties. So let's talk nice properties. So it is associative, again, when defined. Right, it's worth noting that when I do A times B, I have to have that the columns of A and the rows of B are equal. So as long as those multiplications are defined, you can put the parentheses wherever you want, it doesn't matter. Multiplication distributes across addition, the way you would want it to do it. And it may feel like I just wrote the same thing twice, but I didn't think about it. Um, one of the cooler things about matrix multiplication is that you're allowed to put scaling wherever you want. So if you scale a product, you can actually sneak the scaling inside of the multiplication. That is um, a neat little property. I mean, I think I find that neat. Um, and then the main one is here's where the identity comes into play. Multiplying a matrix by the identity doesn't actually do anything. Hence, its name, and hence why the identity matrix wasn't just the matrix full of ones. Right, why it had to be this diagonal matrix. All right, so like I said, it has some nice properties, but it's got some not nice ones. A times B and B times A are not always the same thing. In fact, they are almost never the same thing. Right, so the first, uh, first off, there is the problem of dimension. Right, we need the number of columns of A to match the number of rows of B. 
If you took a 2 by 5 matrix and multiplied it by a 4 billion by 19,000 matrix, it's not going to work. And even if the dimensions did line up, then they're still potentially going to be different. Here's one such example. The matrix 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, if you multiply them up, change the order, you will get different things. Right. So row, column, first row, first column. 1 times this will give me 1, 0 dies, first row, second column, 1 times 2 gives me the 2, and now this is a row of 0, so it's just going to kill it, and then similar thing happens over here. So, matrix multiplication is not commutative. A times B is not necessarily B times A. Right, now that on its own makes matrix multiplication a lot more interesting than if we were to just do it entry-wise, right? There is better reasons for that, we'll see in a little bit, but... Off the bat, it's more interesting mathematically since we don't have commutativity, so we got to be really careful about it. The other weird thing I want to point out is that you can have things that divide zero. Right, so in other words, I can find two matrices that multiply to zero, but neither of them were zero. So immediately, matrix multiplication has some really bizarre algebraic stuff going on with it. All right, now let's talk about why the hell we care about matrix multiplication in the first place. Why, well, why we care about this way of multiplying and why we aren't doing entry-wise multiplication. Consider the following system of equations. Well, we've ran a file of these at some point in our lives. It's just asking, I've got two lines. I want to know where they intersect. Please solve. Right, you've seen stuff like this already pop up. Like when you're, oh, I don't know, doing partial fractions. It turns out that what I just wrote here is actually a matrix multiplication in disguise. Specifically, that equation, that system of equation, two equal signs, I could turn into a matrix equation that has one equal sign. So I've improved my situation vastly. So specifically, the matrix A consists of 1, negative 3, negative 1, 2, and the vector x has the variables x and y in them, and b is the right-hand side, 1, negative 8. So note that this multiplication would say first row times first column, 2 times x plus negative 3 times y equals b, the first entry 1 there. Boom. And the same thing happens for that second equation right there. Okay, so here is the money. We want to learn how to solve systems of differential equations. Systems of equations are best represented as matrices. Ah, nice. Right, and there's a lot of reasons why, and we'll get into it as we uh, do this uh, wonderful overview of the world of matrices. Okay, so we can write a matrix as an augmented matrix, meaning that that system right there, I can really write it as this, where I'm basically hiding the X and the Y with that bar. And in this form, we can now perform what are known as the elementary row operations. Specifically, I can swap the rows. So here I swap the first row and the second row. I could scale a row and add it to another one. So I could scale the first row by two and add it to the second one. That gives me that. Do the same thing. Add the second row uh, multiplied uh, by negative two to the first one. That gives me this. And then I scale that first row by negative one and it gives me that. Now, this augmented matrix, remember, that bar is hiding that there's an X and a Y in equal signs. But now... I'll get 1 times x equals that, 1 times y equals that, and boom, I actually now solve my matrix equation ax equals b. I found the vector x, the two numbers x and y, that make that equation work. All right. Nice. So you've potentially done this before. Um, if you haven't, don't get too sweaty. We're not really going to do too much of this, but it's worth noting um, that these are the things you do. If this all looks super interesting and sounds like the coolest stuff you've ever seen, you might want to take Math 207, Matrices and Linear Algebra. All right. 
So let's keep talking about this. So it turns out that uh, those systems of differential equations that we want to solve can be written as matrix equation, such as this. Now, if you look at this, and I say solve for x, the first thing you would probably think of doing is, well, divide by a, obviously. But, as we just discussed, matrix multiplication, which is what's going on there, a times x, does not behave at all like regular multiplication. So dividing by that is probably not a thing we're allowed to do. So, what, uh, sorry, so what are we going to do? Alright, so we say a square matrix is invertible, also known as non-cigular. If there is a matrix, so we'll call a to the negative 1, so that multiplying a by a to the negative 1 gives me the identity matrix. And vice versa. So again, no, we need to stress this uh, multiplication uh, here in both possible orderings, because we don't necessarily know that they're equal a priori. We don't know beforehand that they are the same thing. All right. Now, if we had such a matrix, then the matrix equation A x equals B, you can then solve it by dividing out by A. But when we say divide out by A, we mean that we'd have to do that specifically. So note here I am explicitly using associativity to help me out, and noting that multiplying by the identity doesn't do anything. All right. So, natural question. Can matrices be inverted? And if they can, how do you figure out what A inverse is? All right, well, it turns out uh, that for a 2 by 2 matrix, they're invertible precisely if this magic number is non-zero. A times D minus B times C. And you may have seen this before. Specifically, the inverse then has a nice formula, it's that, hence note I need the uh, AD minus BC to be non-zero there. If it uh, was zero, then that division cannot happen. Now, for an example, uh, 1, 2, 3, 7 is invertible, and there's its inverse right there. And that's it. Just plug it in to the formula. Now, this formula right here, this is a good one. This is one that you want to uh, burn somewhere in your brain. You know, so go to your go to your container, open it up where you got the quadratic equation, and I'll put this one right next to it. Right, this is a good one to burn somewhere in your brain uh, if you haven't had the uh, pleasure of doing so already. All right, so um, note that if I tweaked my matrix one, two, three, seven ever so slightly, if I replace the seven with a six. I end up with a matrix that's not invertible because the magic number AD minus BC is equal to zero. So note something, this matrix, at first glance, doesn't seem like there's anything wrong with it, right? It's got nice positive integers in it. How could it possibly not have an inverse? Probably has something to do with the fact that um, 1, 3, and uh, 2, 6 is, uh, oh, those are, those are multiples of each other, aren't they? Multiply this uh, column by 2, you get the other one. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> All right, so as I noted, if you have an invertible matrix, the matrix equation can always be solved uniquely. And uh, in fact, the reverse is true. If you can always solve the matrix equation uniquely, then you have a inverse. And you could specifically create it by setting this up and um, solving for the x's, where those e sub k's are what are known as the standard basis vectors, which are the vectors that have 1 in one spot and 0 everywhere else. Um, your textbook uh, talks about how this happens, specifically using row operations. You set up a very specific augmented matrix and you row reduce it. Um, if you're interested, you can look into that a little bit more, but we're not going to go any further than that. Now, as good as all of that is, it'd be great if there was a much better way of detecting uh, matrix inverse, and it turns out there is. There's a magic number. Not only for 2 by 2s there are magic numbers for even bigger matrices. The problem is that um, they're not very fun to define. So the determinant of a matrix 
is a number that is recursively defined, meaning that I'm going to tell you initial information, and then I'm going to tell you how to compute other values based off the initial information. So initially, if I have a one by one matrix, which is a thing, it's a rectangular array with exactly one thing in it, then you take the determinant to just be the thing that's inside the matrix. For an n by n matrix, then what you do is you compute the determinant by deleting rows and columns, computing determinants, and then multiplying by negative signs and other junk, and oh boy, this, it looks like a good time. And um, speaking of Laplace, you have him to blame for this one, so if, if you're looking at this and you're puking, yeah, yeah, Laplace is uh, he's coming back. He wants revenge. All right, but um, this may look awful, but it's really not that bad. So, for example, for a 2 by 2 if you follow the formula precisely, you get our magic number of AD minus BC. Oh, look at that. The magic 2 by 2 number that we just saw is actually its determinant. Hmm, interesting. Now, um, you can compute determinants for 3 by 3, 4 by 4, higher and higher. Um, the number of operations gets obscenely large very quickly. Um, it basically grows at a rate of n factorial, so good luck finding the determinant of a 10 by 10 matrix. Um, there are more efficient algorithms, but it generally is n factorial operations. <laughs> oh boy. So, uh, let's talk 3x3, three three, and I'll use an alternative notation, um, and this might conjure up some things that you've already encountered. I'm going to find the determinant of this thing, I'm going to pick the first row to do it, and then I'm going to do that Laplace expansion that I just talked about, where I'm going to take the first row, so I have 1, 0, 1, a plus, a minus, a plus, delete row, delete column, determinant what's left over, Delete row, delete column, determinant of what's left over. Delete row, delete column, determinant of what's left over. And if this looks a lot like a cross product, that's because that's what that was. It's a determinant in disguise. Now, note that, um, of course, cross products, another way you uh, uh, learn that is with this technique called uh, basket weaving, or however you want to call it. Don't We're not going to get sweaty about these. We're just worth pointing them out. But a 3 by 3 determinant comes out quite nicely in here, and hey, look, we've got a negative 27. All right, determinants could be negative, even though all the numbers involved were positive. Um, not too bad. And note the notation that I use is a vertical, uh, vertical uh, lines for the matrix. Uh, we'll interchange between that and the determinant. The reason for the vertical lines here is to sort of put somewhere in your memory uh, like this idea of uh, like a size, because it turns out that the absolute value of your determinant, um, at least for a 2 by 2 and a 3 by 3 is related to area and volumes. Um, I'm going to leave that there. But again, if that sounds like the coolest thing ever, check out Math 207. All right, let's keep trudging along mile after mile. The following is true and not easy to show at all, uh, which is that a matrix is invertible precisely if its determinant is non-zero. We saw this for the 2x2 two two case, and we also saw that you got a nice formula, and in fact, that's always true. Right, it was one of my prouder moments in uh, high school mathematics. We were learning about matrices in um, pre-calculus, at least when I took pre-calc, that's what we did. And I remember my uh, teacher, Mr. Como, he said, uh, there's no formula for the inverse of a 3 by 3, um, to which I said, no, there is. You kidding me? There has to be. Um, and I spent the rest of the day um, ignoring my other classes and coming up with a formula for a 3 by 3 matrix because I am a turbo nerd. <laughs> um, and I got it, and I was very excited by it. And I went and I went and showed him, and I'm like, ha, prove you wrong. Got it. And then he said, yeah. I lied on purpose because that formula is disgusting, and it is. And in fact, he then followed it up with, you know, there's a formula for a 4x4, a 5x5, a 6x6, so on and so forth. They're called the adjugate matrix, and um, they look like that. <laughs> yeah. So it turns out for a 2x2, two two, the adjugate matrix is that special matrix that we saw there, the uh, D, negative B, negative C, A. Um... The one for the 3x3, three three, if you want to look it up, go ahead. It's, it takes up a lot of room. Um, but anyway, they're formed by basically 
reversing those terms that you use to create the determinant itself. So these things are called the cofactors, and yeah, 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 this gets into some fun stuff. But it is worth noting that if you do, for those people that do care, there is a formula out there for the inverse of any n by n, an actual explicit formula for it. Um, but just like the quadratic equation and the cubic equation, anything beyond two just gets gross and there's no reason to have it memorized. But two by two, you want to have that one at the ready. All right, well, all of this is well and good, but again, how are we going to use this for matrices involving differential equations? Well, I got one more thing I want to talk about, and it's going to be the last bit of thing we need before we can fully get into solving systems of linear differential equations. So given a matrix, a, a non-zero vector, uh, let me just say that again, a uh, non-zero vector, a non-zero vector, headphone warning, I guess, uh, is an eigenvector if there's a number lambda called an eigenvalue, so that the matrix multiplication of A times V is the same thing as scaling V. Oh, look at that. So, the name eigen, um, that's a word stolen from German. Um, that has multiple possible translations. Um, the easiest one would be uh, self, uh, but it, it can depending on where it is, it can mean you know whatever. Uh, but anyway, so self vector, self value. So you can see sort of the idea that the vector v scaling and multiplication by a matrix, right? It gives it itself in a way. It's scaled. Okay. Now, um, you, whether or not you know it, you've probably used an eigenvector today, because you probably uh, Googled something. Um, and the reason Google took over the world and is currently listening into this conversation and collecting data on everything I'm saying, um, is they created a search algorithm that used eigenvectors and eigenvalues. They used a really good one called the page rank algorithm. So if you haven't heard of that, check it out. Um, uh, there's a paper written about it. It's like the, the billion dollar eigenvalue or something like that. Anyway. Note that if I subtract the lambda y over, and here I'm doing some matrix multiplication and manipulations, I get this. Again, since I have assumed the vector is non-zero, that means the matrix equation does not have any solutions. That means it's not invertible, and that means its determinant is equal to zero. So we've got a couple of pet peeves in mathematics. Um, one of them is log of one. If you write log one anywhere, I will find you. Um, I know I, I hate log one. Log one is like the most efficient way of communicating to me that you don't know anything. Um, another one is uh, zero is an eigenvector, right? The whole conceit of this damn thing is to get to this equation right here, and you can only get to that if this is non-zero. So it's like if you drop that out, you like lose the entire reason you're even doing it, you know? So this one's a little trickier. It's a little more forgiving, but it's still really annoying. Log one, though. You know what log one is equal to. Do not write log one. Now, uh, that equation right there actually has a name. It's called the characteristic equation. So note how this is being formulated. You give me a number, and I compute a determinant. So it's a determinant value in the same way that we've seen, like, give me a function, I take its integral, and I get an integral-valued function. This is a determinant-valued function. For a 2 by 2 matrix, it ends up being a polynomial. It's a specific a two by two polynomial. Note the constant term is the determinant itself, and the uh, term on lambda is the sum of the diagonals negated. Now, the sum of the diagonal of a matrix is actually called its trace. Um, I don't want to go too off the deep end with all the matrix lore, but uh, trace is really interesting. Um, the trace is actually... Um, there's a really neat property about traces that basically says that um, quantum physics cannot use matrices. It has to use something else. It's pretty neat. If you're interested, um, email me, I guess. I'll, I'll tell you about that. But anyway, um, in general, the characteristic equation is always a polynomial, and its roots are the eigenvalues. 
So that tells us, first off, that there's only finitely many eigenvalues. So that's good to know. Yeah, it does mean that complex numbers are potentially going to show up. And by potentially, I mean they're going to. Right? It's pretty easy to cook up A, B, C, and D that are going to, you know, this is equal to 1, but that's 0. Not hard to cook that up. All right. But uh, anyway, there. Let's finish today off by actually computing eigenvalues and eigenvectors, something that we are going to frequently do when we're solving systems of differential equations. All right. Negative 1, 2, negative 7, 8. There's a matrix. Let's get its eigenvalues, its characteristic equation. Now note, for every 2 by 2, we know exactly what it's going to be. It's going to be lambda squared minus the sum of the diagonal times lambda plus its determinant which in this case is uh, lambda squared minus 7 lambda plus 6, which factors very nicely. And so I've got the eigenvalues R1 and 6. So let me finish up today by finding the eigenvectors for lambda equals 1. You should on your own find the, lambdas, uh, the eigenvectors for lambda 6. Okay. Now, uh, eigenvectors V for lambda 1 need to satisfy that equation. Right, they need to be vectors so that when I do the multiplication, I get zero. And again, they must be non zero vectors, so keep that in mind. Now, if I clean this up, right, this is a matrix equation, it looks like this. Note that now I can read off an equation, specifically, I can read off negative 2 times v1 plus a v2 is equal to zero, row 1, column 1, dot product, then multiply the terms, add them up. And that gives me v1 is equal to v2. Uh, you could do the same thing for uh, negative 7 and 7, but we can just do this to be done. Um, it'll give you the same thing, v1 is v2. So if we go to our vector now, well, v2 is v1, so I can replace with that. And then, hey, I could factor that out. Oh, look, I have a non-zero vector here, 1, 1. Indeed. Any non-zero multiple of that is an eigenvector. So note, there are finitely many eigenvalues, but for each eigenvalue, there are infinitely many eigenvectors. And that shouldn't be surprising, because the property for eigenvector is that multiplying the matrix scales the vector. Well, if you scale both sides, you scale the vector by the same quantity. So you can create infinitely many vectors. Now, for our purposes, um, We'll choose 1-1 one, one and call it a day. We'll get into this more next time when we actually start talking about how to use all this matrix stuff to solve um, systems to differential equations. But it is worth noting that um, if you're, oh, I don't know, using like a software package or something, um, some of them will get um, a little crafty, a little cunning, um, and they'll do something called normalization, and they won't give you a nice... Um, integer uh, eigenvector, they'll give you some decimal gobbledygook. So specifically, um, if I were to ask MATLAB to do this, they wouldn't have given me 1-1, one, one. they would have given me um, 1 over root 2 and 1 over root 2, so 0 0.7078, whatever the hell that is. I've seen it enough times I should have memorized, and I think that's what it is. I don't know. Again, I'm not going to be editing these videos, so whatever. But all right. Okay, well, that was your crash course on linear algebra. We are going to use all of these things to help us solve differential equations. Now, as we just stressed, a couple of these maneuvers that I just talked about and did, we will be doing, so you're going to want to get some practice on this. There will be um, an exciting homework set on it, so get ready to check that out. But otherwise, I'll see you next time, where we'll actually put this stuff to work and start heading towards solving systems of differential equations. Beautiful. Like, comment, and subscribe to my YouTube. <laughs> Bye.